This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. It's time for This Week in Virology. This is a special episode recorded on July 30th, 2014. Hey everybody, I'm Vincent Racaniello. And you are listening to TWIV, the podcast all about viruses. We have a special episode for you today. We're coming to you from Montreal, Canada. We are at the 16th meeting of the International Congress of Virology. This is a really big meeting. It's actually held concurrently with the microbiology meeting. And it happens every four years, I think. Do you know? Three years. And I've got the privilege to come here and record a TWIV in front of an audience of TWIV fans, I presume. And uh, needless to say, uh, this is the world's most popular virology podcast. <laughs> I, I defy anyone to dispute that. So I've got two guests today who were speakers at this meeting. And we're going to talk about something we really don't talk about much uh, on TWIV and that is viruses in the ocean and uh, viruses of insects. So viruses that infect rather small uh, organisms. So I'm really happy to welcome on my left from the University of British Columbia, Curtis Suttle. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks for joining us today. And all the way on the other side from the Institut Pasteur. <laughs> Very good. Carla Sally. welcome. Hey. <laughs> and for Carla, we will have subtitles, right? Yes. You have to speak a little louder <laughs> else I can turn your mic up. Let's see, your mic number three. Uh, we need a little more volume for you. Okay. And we have an audience who's still streaming in, although I don't see Dermody yet, right? <laughs> Remember, I want you to bring him right up here so I can look at him and make jokes. And he's, he's a good, he's a good uh, fo what is it? Uh, foil, foil, that's the word, right? It's a good foil. <laughs> So before we talk about your science, which is what I want to do today, I want to find out where you guys were raised and educated and so forth. And let's start for you. I know that you're from Argentina. You were probably born there, right? Yes. And so I was us. born in Argentina, in Córdoba. That is exactly in the middle of Argentina. It's the second city in size. But it's a very nice place because it has the first university for Latin America. So um, I did all my studies up to my master level over there. And then I moved to the Institut Pasteur in Paris where they, I did my PhD. So my PhD was in myelin development in the central nervous system in mouse. So I was very interested in neurodegenerative disease. Then when I finished my PhD, I decided that in order to be able to invade the brain and to heal a neurodegenerative disease, I was lacking a lot of knowledge in immunology and virology. So I moved to UCSF at the laboratory of Dr. Raul Andino, and I did a postdoc there. Forget the brain, I discovered the insects. The insects <laughs> also have a brain, but well, I discovered <laughs> the insects, and mostly we were there in the moment that RNA interference was discovered. And we described that RNA interference was the immune system, the antiviral immune response of insects. And I get totally interested in trying to understand how insects and viruses co-evolve and have lived this long love life together. And when I finished my postdoc, I got an assistant professor position at Institut Pasteur in Paris, and since last year, tenure. Voila. <laughs> so what, why did you go from Argentina to, to Paris in the first place? That was to get a PhD, right? You had yes. no intention of staying there, though. No, I just went there for my PhD. So <laughs> being from Argentina, do you feel sad these days? Because of the World Cup? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, you cannot always win. That's right. That's right. <laughs> you can do virology, so you can keep doing that. That's right. How about you, Curtis? Were, you're from Canada originally? I am, yeah, originally uh, from Vancouver. Um, I had kind of an unusual, uh, an unusual upbringing, I guess we, uh, 
one of our claim to fame is so that we're the first Canadian family to sail around the world in a sailboat. And Your so, family? Yeah. And so oh. when I was a little kid on the Great Barrier Reef, I came across a ship that was doing oceanography there from the Scripps Institute of Oceanography. And they had set up a camp on the beach and they were studying dugongs and mangroves and crocodiles. And I said, ah, this is what I want to be to grow up when I grow up. So I, that motivated me to, uh, to work on the oceans. And, uh, and it was a long and torturous path because I wasn't a particularly sterling student. And I uh, found my way working through menial jobs as a crematorium repairman and, uh, and working at a fish cannery and things like that. And ultimately uh, went on to uh, got a university degree. And, and uh, that's where I ended up. Never had a course in microbiology or anything, but so. <laughs> so you sp your whole education was in Vancouver. Uh, my undergraduate, I got an undergraduate degree in zoology and a PhD in botany there. And uh, uh, for my postdoctoral work, I went um, to the State University of New York at Stony Brook uh, to work with uh, Jed Furman, who's a marine microbiologist. And yeah, and then uh, took a position as a assistant professor at University of Texas and was there for eight years, I guess. And then one day I got a call from British Columbia asking if I'd be interested in coming back there. So. That's where I ended up, back in British Columbia again. So you spent some time in the Northeast. This not, Stony Brook's not too far from me. Yeah, that's right. That's right. It's, a, it's a, quite a nice part of the world. And I, I can always remember when I got the it, invitation to go to Stony Brook, they said, um, you'll love it here. We're out in the country. <laughs> and uh, so my perception of the country was changed because in a 30-mile radius of where I lived, there was more people than all of Canada. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Right. so uh, as I said, we haven't talked about what either of you have worked on uh, in your laboratory, so that'll be a little bit of fun. And maybe we could start with you, Curtis. Uh, I remember hearing you at a meeting in Germany, was it last year, give a talk. And one thing you said that struck me was, at some point in the past, I don't remember how long ago, we thought the oceans were pretty much devoid of mi microbial life. Is that the right statement I'm recalling? It, it's certainly at one point, um, I, people always recognized that microbes were there, but they thought they weren't very abundant and, and probably not very important. So um, they got short shrift and, and typically um, classical microbiologists studied them, mm -hmm. uh, growing things on plates and characterizing them biologically and physiologically. Yeah, and, what, so yeah. what changed our view of the abundance of microbes? There was really, uh, what changed our view of the abundance of microbes is really, all of these things happened, I guess, in the mid-70s. And um, uh, to start with, they started using epifluorescence microscopy to look at, at uh, staining nucleic acids. And when they did that, they, they found um, uh, all these particles, DNA positive particles in water, and, and some people were arguing that they were bacteria. But even before that, in the 60s, there were some really provocative experiments where uh, one of the great grandfathers of marine microbiology, I guess, was measuring respiration in the ocean, and he f and he would come back with these data and said that 90% of the respiration in the ocean passes through a one micron filter, <laughs> and everybody would say, "You should learn how to filter water, right?" And then so th this fellow Larry Pomeroy, just an amazing guy, ended up publishing in you know the Indian Journal of Oceanography and things like this because nobody believed that that uh, you could have all of these that 90% of the respiration in the ocean would pass through one micron filter. And because there was no corroborative ed evidence that time, because if you tried to culture bacteria in the ocean, you usually got about two cells per mil or three cells per mil. And it turns out now the average concentration of, of living bacteria in the ocean is in the order we know is in the order of 10 to the fifth to 10 to the sixth um, prokaryotes per mil in seawater. And, and so, uh, that came together and, and also the ability to measure, uh, use radio tracer experiments to look at uptake and microautoradiography. And it took about a decade before people really started to believe that there was microbes in the ocean that were important and living. And uh, probably about 20 years before it started making its way into some textbooks and it's kind of the same mm -hmm. path that we're on with viruses. <laughs> so at what point did you enter this field? Was it established that there was high density microbial life in the ocean? Yeah, so when I finished my PhD, I was actually working, uh, uh, I was a phytoplankton physiological ecologist, I guess, is, and I was very interested in what controls populations and, and what controls population structure. And, and so at that time, my PhD supervisor, a fellow called uh, Paul Harrison, who's well known in, in the field of phytoplankton work, 
Um, but he was working in the same area that his PhD supervisor had worked on, and, and, I was, and it, was, it was getting to be a kind of an old field, and I was trying to think of, well, where could I go? And, and there was a, f a fellow called Farouk Azam uh, at Scripps Institute of Oceanography, and Jed Furman was, was one of his PhD students uh, who had been at Stony Brook relatively recently, and I thought, well, boy, people are just beginning to think bacteria are important in the ocean, and, and why don't I go work with somebody that that's doing this kind of work. So that's how I ended up uh, getting in, at least starting to get my feet wet in, in uh, so speak, microbiology. So to speak, right? Yeah, that's right. And moving from freshwater into seawater, because my PhD work was actually in freshwater. freshwater. So, besides, so are prokaryotes the, by mass the bulk of what's in the ocean? Yeah, absolutely. About 90% of the living material in the ocean by weight, which is remarkable, is prokaryotic. And I always stress this because it's not obvious to people that, that these microbes produce half the oxygen on the planet um, and it's 90% of the biomass and most people aren't even aware they're there. And, and so the discovery of bacteria and uh, has really changed our perception in terms of global geochemical cycles or bacteria in the ocean and how important they are has changed our perception on global biogeochemical cycles, what's going on, and then the fact now that we recognize that viruses remove about 20% of that standing stock every day, uh, that's where we start to s sort of look at the ecological importance of viruses in these systems. I think in one of your papers you say whales are great, but they're pretty meaningless. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I have to be careful <laughs> depending, you know, the charismatic megafauna uh, are important, and, uh, but not in terms of uh, global biogeochemistry. Yeah, yeah. So as aside from prokaryotes, which is the bulk, what else is there that we can't see? Well, the, the proteases in terms of biomass are about, they're in about the same amount of carbon if you, if you look at in terms of carbon. So the bacteria, there's about five uh, teratons of carbon and bacteria in the ocean. And the viruses and the proteases are the second most abundant in terms of living carbon in the ocean. And they're both about the same, but they're, um, uh, they're considerably less. Okay. So how did you get interested in the viruses uh, in the ocean. You said you were interested in the, the effect on controlling populations. Yeah, I, I, I am, I've been very fortunate. I went in, to work in Jed Furman's lab, and I, was, I wanted to take some ideas from freshwater, and I was actually studying amino acid cycling in the Sargasso Sea, which is this uh, subtropical ocean off of Bermuda. And uh, Jed had a PhD student working in his lab, Lita Proctor, and uh, she was doing her PhD with Jed, and, and she was discovering all of these viruses uh, in seawater, and she was looking at them with electron microscopy and, and recognizing that um, it looks like that they're very important mortality agents. Uh, her and Jed published a really nice paper in Nature. And so when I took up my assistant professor position at Texas, and you're sitting in your laboratory and you're saying, well, I have an empty lab, and I guess I'm supposed to do something, right? <laughs> and so I thought uh, there was a lot of circumstantial evidence that viruses are likely important uh, in infecting the proteas, and the proteas are major players in the primary production in the world's oceans. There had been kind of three papers published. There was one in the 1970s that uh, a fellow called Max Taylor had published a nice paper in Nature showing that viruses were infecting a small, very ecologically important uh, microalga. And, and they published this, this wonderful paper. And, uh, and when I came back to UBC, he came up to me, because he was at UBC, and he said, would you like a reprint? Nobody ever asked for one, right? <laughs> because there was just no context to that. So he published a nice paper. There was reports in the literature of autolysis of phytoplankton blooms. You know, they would be out there every day, and then the next day they would go back, and there would be free chloroplasts in the water. And so, there, and so they said they don't know why that happened. And then the third observation was quite a few electron microscopy images in the literature of little cells that were packed with icosahedral particles. And so it seemed like those three things together said, well, maybe... Maybe viruses are important in, in regulating uh, the protestin uh, phytoplankton out there. So, so we actually went and tried to repeat the experiments of Max Taylor because the viruses were all thrown away because nobody wanted them and they were all pouring, poured down the sink. And, and uh, we went and the first experiment we did worked beautifully. And then from there we ended up being able to isolate a whole bunch of uh, new viruses from seawater that people hadn't seen before, which infected uh, major primary producers. So as a result of being in Jed's lab, meeting Lita, she was discovered all these viruses infecting the, the prokaryotes there. So we started working on the, um, on the protestin viruses and, uh, and kind of have been steaming along since then. 
So can you tell us how you discover these viruses? I guess you have to get on a boat and sample, right? Yeah, so we do lots of things like that. We, we go on boats and you get water. Um, so there's a couple of things that we do. But if we're trying to isolate new viruses, then we essentially do bioassays. So if you have a target that you're interested in, and so we typically try and pick something that's important for some reason, it's either ecologically important or somebody's interested in it. And then we will, we go out and we concentrate virus communities from seawater typically. So we'll take 200 liters of seawater, uh, filter it through a bunch of filters to get rid of the big stuff like bacteria. And then we'll take the remaining uh, particulate material and concentrate it about a thousand fold by ultrafiltration. So we'll take that 200 liters of water and, and concentrate it maybe down to 200 milliliters. And those concentrated virus communities then we can use to inoculate cultures and see if we can get lysis. And, and we archive those communities. So we've got about 3,000 of these virus communities collected all over the world now from, from Southern Ocean to the Arctic Ocean to, uh, you know, deep sea samples from two or three kilometers deep. And so we can go back and we can interrogate those samples mm -hmm. to try and look for mm -hmm. infectious viruses. So you can go down just a few kilometers. You don't go below that? Um, <clears throat> you can. I mean, the, the trouble is on a ship, uh, wire time is expensive. And, and, uh, and so you've got to send big bottles down to great depths. And, and the ships are sometimes tens of, tens of thousands of dollars a day to operate. And so if you're going to sit out there, it might take four or five or six hours to do a, to do a bottle cast down to, uh, to those depths of the ocean. So you don't do very many of them. And the second part of that is pretty much all of the major ecological processes are happening in the upper 200 meters of the water column. And so if you're really interested in where everything's happening, you know, where the active infections are and things like that, we, we typically look at the the upper, upper 100 meters, 200 meters of water. So the, the famous number of what, a million viruses per teaspoon or something like that per milliliter, that's mostly the upper reaches of the oceans? So the lowest concentration of viruses that we find almost anywhere in the ocean is a million per mil. The lowest. Yeah, okay. and so the rest are up in the order of about 10 million per mil. So coastal waters is 10 million offshore in, in the very nutrient deplete regions were sort of a million. Maybe in the deep ocean were five. 500,000, 700,000, but typically around a million per mil. And then you go down to hydrothermal vents, and those are actually fountains of viruses that are just mm -hmm. spewing out into the ocean. It's amazing. <laughs> they're spewing out of the vent. Yeah, yeah. Because so there's something in there. Because of all the microbial life that's around the vents. And, and you can actually follow these plumes of viruses in the ocean for uh, 20, 30, 50, 100 kilometers. You can just wow. see these plumes of viruses that are coming out. So, so I was looking at some of your papers, and you have this cool thing called a rosette. Ah. Tell us about that. What's well, not a flower, right? <laughs> yeah. It kind of looks like a flower, perhaps, but, but it's just a, so a rosette is, is just a, basically a metal frame in which we can, we can put bottles that we can trigger at any depth uh, electronically. So it's, it's actually pretty cool. So you can get a, these rosettes, if you can imagine a big round frame with, with a bunch of, uh, it looks like a Gatling gun, if you know what that thing is, with, with little barrels all the way around it. And you lower that into the ocean. But as it goes down in the ocean, we can measure all the oceanographic properties in real time. So we can do salinity, temperature, chlorophyll even, and, and oxygen as it goes down. So we can get uh, a profile of the water. And then so we lower it down as deep as we want to go. And then once we've decided where we want to sample on the way up, we just fire bottles. And, and it opens uh, them up. And it, yeah, yeah they go down open, and then they, it closes them, right? And so we can grab right. water, or we can fire multiple bottles at, at any given depth. It's much better than the old days when I started as an undergraduate and used to have to actually lower these bottles on wires that went down, and you actually had to manually send down what's called a messenger. Mm -hmm. And you had to pull these bottles off the wire as they came up. And of course, once you get below about 200 meters or so, the water temperature is four degrees or, and, and colder. And mm. so, so you're freezing hands as you pull these bottles off. So the rosette uh, certainly simplifies things. This is not your usual laboratory microbiology. I mean, I've seen some movies of people sampling. You can have rough weather, and these rosettes are big, and they're dangerous if they bump into you, right? They certainly can be. So yeah, there's, there's, uh, uh, and there's often, and they're also incredibly expensive, right? So you, so you're, you're throwing over the side of a ship in a storm, you know, sometimes maybe a half a million dollars worth of gear, and uh, it's yeah, all yeah. very counterintuitive, right? And and hoping that you'll be able to pull it back on board. And some of the the most interesting stuff has been sampling the Arctic Ocean, where where 
We actually had an icebreaker frozen into the ice for a year up there. Well, it was frozen for about six or seven months. Uh, I had a graduate student, Jerome Payette, who's from a tropical island in the Indian Ocean, and so it seemed like a, a great place for him to spend Christmas and New Year's <laughs> <laughs> up for, in the complete darkness for three months. But, uh, but that kind of thing, again, where you have to lower these things through the ice and bring it up and the ice closes around, the, you know, is all of these kind of logistic issues that can be quite challenging sometimes. And then you bring it, all this stuff back to the lab to do your culturing and sequencing and so forth. Well, yeah. these ships actually have, if you're in a real oceanographic ship, you know, they're out there for months at, at a time, and, and in some cases, and they'll, they have very, very well equipped laboratories on board. So you have wet labs and dry labs, and, and, <clears throat> and if you're in a polar region, they'll, they'll be able to usually bring the, depending on the ship, bring the rosette into an enclosed room, which you keep at about four degrees or something like that, or uh, just above freezing. And, uh, and then you can do all your sampling in there, and so you can do all your processing. Um, sometimes people take the actual molecular biological tools, but, but high voltage equipment and seawater aren't terribly compatible. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so sometimes you yeah, don't really yeah. want to have, you try and eliminate, or also ultra centrifuges don't go very well on ships either. So there's certain things that just don't, you don't take on ships. But a lot of the stuff we can process mm -hmm. on ships now. Mm -hmm. And we'll try and get the samples uh, in condition that we can take them back to a, uh, onshore laboratory and do yeah. standard kinds of things. I, I presume you lease these ships. They're owned by companies that do this for a living, right? They're mostly government ships, and so they're highly competitive, um, and uh, you know, and they're expensive to operate. I know the icebreaker that we were on burned twenty thousand liters of fuel an hour when we were breaking ice, right? So, so you can imagine that's uh, uh, not an inexpensive operation. It has a crew of forty or fifty. Um, so yes, yeah, so the governments are usually highly competitive programs to get uh, to get these ships. The, the U.S. has a whole program called UNALS, for example, which tries to manage these assets, and Canada has its own way of doing it. And it's very complicated because they're expensive to run, but the infrastructure's there, and so they have to find a way to use it, right? So, so, uh, but it's always highly competitive. I mean, I, I, it's I, I don't mean to focus on this aspect, but it's so fascinating for the, those of us who are just dealing with Eppendorf tubes and pipette men, right, that you have this whole other sampling issue that is so complicated. And as you train people to go out, then you have competition for the ships, right, that they, these people want to, how, how often do you go out? Once a year, basically? So we used to go out pretty much every year. It depends. I mean, it, we're, you tend to be highly networked, and uh, so there's lots of ship of opportunities. Um, you know, depending on what ship it is, what program it is, you know, you may know a group that's got cruises out of Hawaii once a month, and, and you might try and get a berth on that, uh, get your equipment out there. Um, it, it really depends. Uh, uh, it can be, we always try and focus our ship time around questions. I mean, it seems like a fishing expedition, you know, in the sense <laughs> you're out there catching water all over the place. But typically, we try to be pretty strategic in terms of where we go and why we go there. And, and often we have very specific scientific questions that we're trying to tackle as opposed to just collecting water everywhere and, and uh, looking at it. So, right. so for s different, for instance, the polar oceans are completely different than the other oceans in terms of what's there. So can you find basically every kind of virus in the ocean, RNA, DNA, double-stranded, single-stranded, retroviruses, the whole lot? We haven't found free retroviruses yet, so, so uh, but, um, and we certainly haven't found all the families of viruses that are there, but we certainly find, have found you know, double-stranded RNA, single-stranded RNA, positive sense, negative sense, single-stranded DNA, and double-stranded DNA. So, and viruses infecting eukaryotes and viruses infecting prokaryotes, and looks like viruses infecting archaea as well. Mm -hmm. so, so I think all of those pieces are there. Um, I think what's more fascinating is the fact that you find lots of viruses that we actually have no idea what they are, but we know they're viruses. And How do you so, know they're viruses? Well, you can, you can look at um, their genomic content, and, and in most cases, I mean, you get complete genomes, you have open reading frames. Uh, uh, in most cases, you'll find maybe uh, some similarity to a viral gene that's been seen before or something like that, but they're, they're pretty clearly viral. And so one of the biggest questions that, that we're interested in, many people are, is trying to connect those viruses, those, and in terms of what organisms do they affect, right. infect, and, and what their impact is on, on the system. How do you do so, that? So how do you know what the host is of a particular genome that you've got? Uh, 
So there isn't an easy way to do that at this point. I mean, a lot of it's fortuitous. We can, sometimes you're lucky, you'll do a complete genome of a virus or a, that you've assembled and you'll find a, a perfect homolog to a gene, say from a bacterium that's been sequenced in the ocean, probably metagenomically as well. And so you'll be able to put those two together. There's been some uh, recent successes from uh, uh, single amplified genomes for cells uh, where they've sequenced a, a bacterium or a protist and they find huge copy numbers of a particular virus in there. And so then that also gives you some insights into that. But that's really, you know, some of the, the kind of the holy grail things that we're after is, is trying to figure out not only what the viruses infect, but also uh, taxon specific mortality. So, so how do these individual viruses regulate populations, carbon, energy flow, things like that. So. So uh, you, you said in one of your papers, most of the genetic information on Earth is viral. That's just sheer numbers, right? Uh, well, abs not, in, but also in terms of diversity, because it's still amazing. And, and uh, as I mentioned in my talk here, if you still go out and you take a sample of seawater, you extract the viral nucleic acids, the chances are, in most cases, that 80% of the coding sequences will still have no similarity to anything else that's been seen in the database before. So that means 80% of the sequence are coding proteins for which we have absolutely no idea what they're doing. And so we're nowhere near closing the sequence space on viruses in the ocean yet. What's interesting, you know, people talk about the huge diversity of prokaryotic diversity in the ocean. Mm -hmm. and, and not to take anything away from the people that are looking at prokaryotic diversity, but if you take bacteria from the ocean, you sequence the nucleic acids from there. Typically, maybe 5% of the open reading frames are completely new that haven't been seen before. Everything else is mapped. And usually if you go back and drill down into those open reading frames, they're, they're prophage. They're viruses, virals, viruses that are incorporated into the genome of the bacteria. So the sequence space for prokaryotes is pretty much closed, I think. At least we've seen the sequences. It doesn't mean we know what they do, but at least we've seen the sequences before. Uh, with the viruses, in most cases, we, we haven't seen the sequences before. So you talk about closing the sequence space. Is this something that's doable given the number of particles in the ocean? Yeah, I think so. And, and I think we've, we're, we've had some recent successes. A single strand of DNA viruses is an interesting one because we basically didn't know they existed 10 years ago. And the fact that we found them was pretty fortuitous. It was a fluke, actually. Um, and. Uh, when we went out there and we started purifying single-stranded DNA and, and looking at all the viruses out there, when we first looked at them, only 10% of the, uh, the sequences that we pulled out, we were actually able to assemble a lot of genomes because the genomes are small, but when we pulled them out, only 10% uh, of them had hits to anything that was known, uh, and those 10% actually covered uh, six of the seven known families of single-stranded DNA viruses. The rest of the 90% had no hits, but after we assembled the genomes, from those who were able to recruit about 75% of the metagenomic data back to those reads from different samples from around the world. And so, <clears throat> so my, <clears throat> excuse me, so my guesstimate is that um, at least for the most abundant viruses, we've probably got at least about 75% of the sequence space for those closed. Uh, it doesn't, maybe we may go to some environment which is completely different that hasn't been sampled at all. But, so I'm pretty optimistic. So, and, and so we can, in certain groups of viruses now, uh, viruses infecting, well, I would have thought cyanobacteria were, we were fairly close to closing the sequence space, but now there's been some completely new ones that have been found again. So, so um, yeah, but I'm optimistic. I don't think it's impossible. So how many, how many infections per second are there in the ocean? So this is Roger Hendrick's calculation. <clears throat> And his estimate is about uh, Avogadro's number per second, so about 10 to the 23rd infections per second, right? Which makes sense based on what we know about the mortality. So if you back calculate that, that's, that's about right. So in terms of infections, the number of human infections compared to that is trivial. I would assume so. <laughs> so most of what goes on, and, and I want to get to this in a moment, but these infections have an important role in, in the Earth cycles, right? Tell us a little bit about what these infections are doing. Yeah, they're, well, they, they're important in a whole bunch of different ways. I mean, one of the things that's interesting is, is that there's a whole group of these viruses which infect cyanobacteria, for instance, which encode some of the major proteins for photosynthesis. So when they infect, actually, the cells, cellular photosynthesis is shut down and viral photosynthesis spins up, right? So, so you see those kinds of things which are, which are kind of unexpected. Um, but if you look at just the, um, the movement of nutrients that 
that come about as a result of viral lysis. It's really remarkable um, because they actually generate much of the primary productivity that's going on in the ocean. We did some experiments uh, many years ago with uh, Stephen Wilhelm and um, Marcus Weinbauer when they were postdocs in my lab, and these are environmental virologists now that are quite well known. And we went out into the Gulf of Mexico, found a, a bloom of Synecococcus, and said this is a, which is a small cyanobacterium which produces about 25% of the primary production in the world, actually. And, uh, <clears throat> and so we said, here's a good place to look at what's the effect of viruses on these. And so we found was completely the opposite of what we were expecting. When we took the viruses away, photosynthesis stopped. And uh, uh, we couldn't understand what was going on. It was 20 years before we finally published this paper because I wouldn't let it get published until we had a mechanism, right? And so it turns out what's happening is viruses are infecting the heterotrophic bacteria. The heterotrophic bacteria are lysing and releasing the organic material. That organic material is taken up by other heterotrophic bacteria. But because the stoichiometry, the amount of carbon and nitrogen in a bacterium is pretty much fixed at about four to five um, atoms of carbon for every atom of nitrogen, and the other bacteria are feeding on it, they don't have enough carbon, they have too much nitrogen, and so they deaminate the nitrogen, spit out the nitrogen, the primary producers are short of nitrogen, they take up the nitrogen, and that stimulates the primary production, and they produce more carbon than which feeds the bacteria. So, so it's, it's, uh, the viruses are completely greasing the wheels of, of these global biogeochemical cycles. The other thing that's really interesting, the way, the form that the nutrients are released is very different from viral lysis than, say, if you're eaten by something. So, for example, one of the other elements that's really short, in short supply in the ocean is iron. Iron is basically insoluble in seawater. So, but what happens is iron, which is released from lysed cells, is organically complexed and soluble and being taken up by other organisms and, uh, and supply the, the much needed iron in those systems. And so what we're realizing is that, in fact, the viruses are absolutely integral to these biogeochemical cycles on a global scale. And so, um, so that's something, again, that's, that's you know, gradually working its way into, uh, into ocean, or, you know, oceanography textbooks and things like that. But it's taking a long time because it's such a new concept. Uh, oceanographers really don't know much about viruses mm -hmm. and uh, even not very much about bacteria, right? So, It's interesting that probably most of the world's population w wouldn't appreciate the beneficial role of viruses because most of the news is all about bad ones that make us sick, right? But this really hasn't percolated in. Yeah, no, it's really, really funny, actually. The BBC in, in the UK did a program called Why Do Viruses Kill? And, and they found out that, <laughs> that, I, that I'm very often spinning the stories about why, that we wouldn't even exist if it wasn't for viruses, right? That we would, probably wouldn't be on this planet. And, uh, and that, I think... You, th you think so? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I, absolutely I absolutely think so. And so uh, they called me up on the phone and, and I said, yeah, I mean, you could drink a liter of seawater and you've drank more viruses than there are people on Earth and it wouldn't make you sick. So they flew out their film crew from the BBC. <laughs> and they, they filmed you <laughs> drinking a liter of seawater. <laughs> they, took, they took me out in a boat. They brought their beer mug from a pub in the UK somewhere, a <laughs> liter size, and they said, okay, now drink the seawater. And so I was okay when it started, but, but there was two things. One is they had to do about 20 takes because they wanted to do it from every angle. And then I was out there off Vancouver, and Vancouver... Uh, doesn't have secondary sewage treatment. They just have mm. settling, right? Mm. And, and, the, and the water had come right around from the Fraser River, which is this big river. And, and, the, and I could just tell by the taste that the salinity was probably about only half strength seawater. So yeah. that meant it was half river water, which where the sewage plant dumps into, right? And so, and so I, I thought, well, it's a good test, right? Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah, so, yeah. And I didn't get sick, and I, I, I drank quite a lot of So is this water. video available somewhere online? Uh, it's on, yeah, BBC has it on New Horizons, but I, I don't, I think it's, I don't know if it's publicly available. Oh, or not, we can but. find anything on the internet. We'll, <laughs> find, we'll, we'll find it. So if you took, if you could, uh, theoretically, if you could remove all the viruses from the ocean, what would be the effect on the Earth? If you took all the viruses out, the primary production in the ocean would stop or slow down greatly. It wouldn't necessarily stop, but the wheels would slow down greatly. So you'd have much, more photo, much less photosynthesis. You'd have much less oxygen production going on. You would have um, probably um, effects that would percolate all the way up through the food chain in terms of 
safe because the nutrients are supplying the primary producers, which are the food source mm -hmm. for the mm -hmm. zooplankton and the fish. You'd probably have low, lower standing stocks of fish. I mean, there's the, probably the, the implications would probably be quite profound. Um, but uh, yeah, so at this point, it's not an experiment that we've done. Right. But. Um, it's just a, it's a thought. <laughs> it's a thought experiment to emphasize the importance that they play. So the the fish that live in the sea would go down in number, and we wouldn't be able to harvest them. So yeah, I mean that that because the primary production in the system would slow down, and 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 essentially when photosynthesis is slowing down, then then you're going to have have large consequence effects, and 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 it could have many other. It, it certainly would affect the balance, the, the, you know, the global geochemical balance of everything from, oceanographers think a lot about export production. This is a really big deal because we have a large buildup of CO2 in the atmosphere because of, say, anthropogenic effects that we're all aware of. I hope as scientists we're all aware that we have a big CO2 problem. And, uh, and the interesting thing is that that CO2 um, is dissolving in the ocean, right? So the oceans are gradually becoming more acidic. But that's also that, that CO2 in the ocean is what the primary producers use to, to grow. And what happens when the primary producers grow, um, the particles actually sink out, and that's called exported carbon. And once you, you're below about 200 meters, that carbon's trapped for about 5,000 years. And so uh, people look at that a lot because that's really important in controlling the balance of CO2 in the atmosphere and in the deep ocean. So the export production is really important. Now viruses change the export production because they lyse cells and it doesn't sink. And you would think that that's probably a bad thing because the carbon's not sinking. So, but actually the interesting thing is we have some papers that we've published because viruses affect the stoichiometry. Because, because phosphorus is highly mobile, nitrogen is highly mobile, carbon tends to be tied up in cell wall materials and things like that, which is much less mobile. So actually, I, my hypothesis is, and uh, we're still running experiments to try and test this, is that viruses actually increase the efficiency of what we call the biological pump because they recycle the nitrogen and phosphorus really quickly through cell lysis, phosphorus, nitrogen, and iron, but the carbon, which is tied up in cell wall materials and things like that, is not recycled easily and actually uh, <clears throat> uh, coalesces into larger particles which export. So I actually think you end up recycling the things that are important and exporting more of the carbon. So I think viruses actually are helping us with the, with the global CO2 problem as opposed to doing the opposite. So uh, the, the thing is that the scales of these things are so massive, I think that's what, what's hard to grasp. I mean, the viruses are so small in their interactions, it's just that they're so numerous. When you start talking about gigatons of carbon, and things like that being cycled through this, what we call the viral shunt. Uh, it has a massive impact. And we, this is something recently recognized, right? So what did we think happened before we understood that viruses were playing these important roles? Yeah, I mean, they were just absent from all the models, right? And so we're actually working with a group now uh, from MIT and Princeton and the University of Tennessee, and we're actually trying to incorporate uh, viruses into these big global geochemical models uh, that are run by MIT and Princeton and, and they have all of these different layers of the ocean and we're actually trying to to quantitatively determine the impact of viruses on these global scale processes. So I'm curious about something you said earlier. You, you said you think all life probably emerged from viruses, is that right? Do you think viruses were here first before cellular life? No, I, I wouldn't say that. But I would say that I think the people are, are coming to the understanding, or at least there's, there's a, a center of gravity, I think, that's changing, that would argue that the same genetic material that gave rose to cellular life also gave rose to viral life. And so the viruses are, I mean, you can't, I mean, the thing I think in my perspective that's most persuasive is you can't build viruses from cellular life. I mean, almost none of the genetic information we find in viruses are found in cells. Interesting enough about all the genes that are found in cells are found in viruses, but that's the result of co-opting that genetic information, I think, in many cases. And uh, so I don't think they're a viral origin. But we can go back, for instance, and you can look at the, uh, the um, proteins, core, uh, the core reaction proteins of photosynthesis, which are found in viruses, and you can see where, the, where they were co-opted from the cyanobacteria into the viruses probably a billion or two years ago, and now they're viral photosynthetic genes. They have their own monophyletic history. And so that, that's happened over time, but most of the viral genes have no, uh, we can't find anything that's similar in, similar in cellular life. And so whether that cellular life has died out long ago and there's no record of it, um, 
But there really isn't any reason to believe that viruses couldn't have come from that same soup of genetic material that gave rose yeah. to cellular life. I mean, it's kind of silly to, to propose experiments removing viruses because you can't, but you can imagine if they weren't present. And this is, that's also kind of unusual because as soon as, as uh, people say, as soon as there's an opportunity to cheat, cheaters arise, right? So you can't really have evolution without things like viruses and selfish elements, but Without them, you could imagine evolution proceeding in other ways, right? Yeah. So maybe they wouldn't be so necessary. But, but I think one of the things that uh, is always fascinating to me, for the first three billion years of life on the planet, the ecosystems were only prokaryotes and viruses, right? It was bacteria, archaea, and viruses. And that was the whole ecosystem. So in that point, at that point in time, viruses were the only biological entity that was probably recycling organic nutrients and minerals. And so these these things are such highly co-evolved systems. I mean, it's not surprising that we find things like, you know, virophages and all of these selfish elements and, and strange things that are happening because these guys have such a long evolutionary history. So one of the things that has uh, come out of your work and which was why you were at this meeting in Tegernsee last year was the finding of a giant virus of uh, the Crow-V virus, the Crow, Crow V, yeah. Say it, you yeah. say it. Um, yeah, Crow V, yeah. Cafeteria Rowanbergensis. Cafeteria Rowanbergensis, which is a... It's a small um, phagotrophic zooplankton in the ocean, which is pretty uh, ubiquitous. And so you found this virus in, in some of your scans, and it turned out to have a huge genome. Yeah, well, it turns out that if we had actually been able to sequence it when we isolated it, we would have had the first Mimi virus, because we isolated <laughs> it about 25 years ago. And, and we tried so many times to sequence it, but we just couldn't. It was absolutely, and for some reason, we still don't know, we still can't clone uh, the genetic information from, from Crow-V. It, it, we haven't been able to clone it in anything other than really, really small pieces. And uh, so many, many times we tried to, to get it a handle of this is back when we were running slab gels and, and I sequencing yeah. <laughs> when people got a PhD for sequencing a gene and so so this was a pretty uh, pretty horrendous project to try and uh, we it would take you a year to do that that's why <laughs> it would take you decades of that with that <laughs> technology right. yeah. and uh, unless you had some some deep pockets so but uh, yeah so and ultimately uh, uh, Matthias Fischer who organized mm -hmm. this meeting in Germany um, who was a PhD student of mine uh, I had like three or four postdocs and students work on this system, and they, they just gave up after a while. And, and of course, the story of that, the reason that they gave up is because it would always start very easy. God, this thing, why, why, why didn't everybody do this? I don't see why anybody's having any trouble. And then after about six or eight months, the virus, you couldn't grow it anymore. And, but of course, we didn't know that it had a virophage. And so that was the, and so, but Matthias came along and he just went back to first principles, and lucky, we had those things that have been sitting there for about two or three years because the virophage has a much shorter half-life than the big virus, so it died away. And so, so Matt actually got about two, two years of culturing going before the virophage finally took over so all the cultures. What was the size of that genome? Is the size of the, uh, the Crow-V? Uh, it's about uh, 760 KB. So now it's kind of small compared to some of the others, right? Well, it depends. I mean, I like to think <laughs> about we still have the only... <laughs> Mimi virus that actually infects a real host, right? right. <laughs> you know, it just seems like the, uh, you know, the acanthamoeba is some kind of, it seems to be permissive to infection by everything. But this, I mean, I think what's really interesting, we know that these giant viruses are pretty abundant in That's the ocean. That's what I was going to ask you, yeah. And okay. just based on sequence data. And so we know that, that probably their interaction with the, um, the cellular life out there is probably really important. And so I think that's a really interesting area to explore. Actually. So my last question, what, how do you view these giant viruses? Where do they fit into the scheme of things? You know, there've been all sorts of speculations about their origins. What's yours? Gee, I don't know. Show me. <laughs> but they're, they're obviously pretty ancient in, in some respect, but I, I have no opinion in terms of whether they're some <clears throat> reduced form of cellular life that's kind of lost the ability to replicate on its own. There's, that seems like a, uh, there's nothing wrong with that hypothesis, as, as, you know, as, at least as far as I can see. And there's, on the other hand, there, you know, so whether it's, you know, parasite reduction or, or whether... What about <clears throat> gene, gene acquiring? There's another camp that believes that, right? And, and I, th I think that, you know, again, acanthamoeba, I, I really think that this is the thing I think is also really cool, is that protease in general, whether it's Crovi or acanthamoeba, I really think that those are the hotbeds of evolution because, they, <clears throat> because they're phagotrophs. And in fact, if you look at the cafeteria row it's a virivore. I mean, that's, we did experiments years ago showing that it can get 
all of its requirements for phosphorus and nitrogen from the viruses that it ingests in the ocean. It, it just gobbles up viruses as well as bacteria, right? So it's a virivore. But if it eats the wrong virus, then it, it's dead. And, uh, and so, but what you see is you've got these food vacuoles that are packed full of viruses, they're packed full of uh, archaea, they're packed full of other proteins. And so these things, once they're digested, you can just imagine that the opportunity for, for DNA to recombine. Sure, sure, sure. That's interesting. We had a question on TWIV from a listener, and they said, given all this biomass in viruses, does anyone eat them? And apparently the answer is yes. Well, in fact, we have seen zooplankton that only eat viruses. There appear to be absolute specialists, virovore specialists, right? And uh, so, yeah, I mean, it's perhaps not surprising in, in the fact that you, you think, I mean, it's a pretty abundant food source yeah, out there sure. at, at uh, you know, 10 million particles per mil. And if you can avoid being <laughs> infected, it's a good food source. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, so, Curtis, what's your next uh, sailing trip? Do you have one planned? So we don't have any, uh, any expeditions planned in, in the near future. So uh, uh, we have students that are, you know, they go out on ships when, uh, when, mm -hmm. it's, when required, but we don't have any major, say, oceanographic projects that we're, we're involved in right now. You have plenty of stuff in the fridge and freezers that keep you busy for a while? Yeah, we do. We have lots of questions and, and, or, and uh, trying new method. We've always been big on developing new methods for trying to tackle these things. And so we've got a number of projects going on in that way. Terry Dermody just showed up. <laughs> Hi, Terry. You missed the first half. You missed all of Curtis. And I'm so sorry. <laughs> oh, well, well. You'll have to listen to it 10 times over. By the way, oh, I just, I wanted you here because in my introduction, I wanted to tell everyone that Terry Dermody, who invited us to be here and who you're an organizer of this meeting or co-organizer or something, you fall asleep listening to TWIV. <laughs> <laughs> I've had other people tell me that too. And, and I woke up this morning with you. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you. That's why I wanted you here, Terry. All right, let's talk about viruses and insects. Now, you don't go out on ocean voyages to get specimens, but insects are pretty cool nevertheless. Now, you use Drosophila to study? Yes, yeah, so Drosophila is our insect model. Right. And our interest or, or the main question was like, Insects perhaps are not as abundant as viruses on the sea, but it's almost 95% of all the terrestrial species described. And they are super important. They are very abundant. And we normally think of insects and these small stinky things, or they smell bad, <laughs> or they bother us. But actually, without insects, life, it will be impossible. Oh, so if you took all the insects away? It, we will all die. <laughs> Like the viruses in the ocean. Wow. I, <laughs> actually, it's part of the same story. So we mostly know the insects that do bad, but insects are doing a lot of good things, like just think only at pollination. That is, for example, bees pollinate at least 30% of the crops we eat. Um, mosquitoes, even if they are also mean, they pollinate a lot, you know? So they are essential for diversity in Earth. And there is one funny particular thing in insects, that is that they are persistently infected by viruses. I guess I cannot ask him a question, yeah, but I wanted can, to sure. ask if, you, <laughs> if your bacteria or if your prokaryotes are persistently infected or if you have mutualist infections. Yeah, I, I, it's a really a tremendous question, and, and I don't know the answer to that, but we, we find, I'm, I'm convinced that there's a lot of mutualism going on because of the genes that some of these viruses encode, uh, um, they clearly affect the physiology of the organisms when they infect them. And there's a great story of a, a, a colleague who, who took a virus, exposed it to UV radiation for, in a way that's unknown. It became lysogenic, incorporated into the genome of the host when exposed to UV, and then started producing a dark brown pigment that protected the host from sunlight. So uh, I, I'm sure there's lots of those kind of stories. So is yeah. that the case for every virus insect infection? They all are persistent or are there some that are pathogenic? It's depending on the insect. You can get acute infections, but most viruses has the capacity to circulate between acute and persistent infections. Okay. So and one very interesting thing, now if we just think, let, let's concentrate in the insects that are the bad ones, the ones that are vectors for disease. So what makes an insect a good vector is to be persistently infected. So that is a concept that 
it's, it's not well explored, but actually, if you have an insect that is acutely infect, just imagine that you have the flu and you feel really bad. You cannot go to the party. So <laughs> the insect, if it's very sick, cannot go and fly and find you and beat you. But now if the insect is persistently infected with no fitness cause, because really it's like the perfect relationship, so now the insect is in super good shape and become a vector because now it can fly, it can feed, and it can transmit the virus. So persistent is essential for the insect to be a vector. And without persistent, you will not have a vector. So one of the main things that we wanted to understand is how it is possible that then the same virus that in the insect, you know, is okay and is producing nothing, is replicating actively, but there is no fitness cause, then they will go into the human and it will kill you. So how it is possible this persistence? That was the big question driving our idea. So humans have lots of persistent infections also, right? Persistence is all around the yeah. nature. You can find examples of persistence in every file or every organism that you will find. Actually, persistence is one of the most common ways of infection. And yeah. again, we always, you know, we have a tendency to study the virus that are very pathogenic and that kill, but we are persistently infected with a lot of well, things. Well, as we heard, though, in some situations, you want to be lytic, right? Yes. Evolution is selected for mm -hmm. huge amounts of lysis in the ocean because it drives other processes, and it's all, it's all a web, right? But in the Arctic Ocean, in the Arctic Ocean, the viruses actually become lysogenic in the winter. Yeah. And they're lytic in the That's, summer. Yes. So, it's, so they actually, mm -hmm. they like you, they, 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 depending on whether it's their advantage to be a lysogen yes. or a lytic mm -hmm. agent, that's... Yeah, so. So in, in Drosophila, if you infect with various viruses, they become persistent typically? Yes. Doesn't yes. kill the so fly. we can originate. Normally, all the strands of Drosophila that people have in the lab, they don't check for virus because they are doing other kind of right. studies, and they are persistently infected, not only with one, but with several viruses. What are these viruses, for example? Uh, like Drosophila A virus, norovirus, uh, Drosophila specific virus, mm -hmm. okay? Then you can get clean Drosophila, or as clean as we know, because we do deep sequencing, we just look for virus, yeah. viral sequence uh, for everything that is described, let's say that is clean, okay? Right. So then in this clean Drosophila, we can put virus by injection, and then we just wait, and the Drosophilas will get persistent infected. So is a clean Drosophila any less fit than an infected? One. Mm, no, clean drosophilas are very good. Yeah, yeah. So this is something uh, selected in viral evolution to, I to think benefit spread of the virus. Actually, I will guess that perhaps we are not eliminating everything. Yeah. There is perhaps ah. something that we don't know always there. Okay. Okay. So now you think that the defense of the insect is in, in equilibration with the virus to give this persistent infection, Yeah, I right? think it's totally a mutualistic interaction, like the virus and the immune system of the insect are working together in order to reach this persistence, because then the insect can survive, but the virus have the time to transmit mm -hmm. that is what the virus wants. Okay, so in nature, what's the main way that insects would acquire a virus infection? So they will acquire by oral fecal transmission. Mm -hmm. So insects live all together there where they want. They will find food and, you know, <laughs> they wash themselves and, <laughs> and they are there. Where, or they are the, the dead flies and the newborn flies. So it's, Filthy, it's dirty. Yeah. Filthy. Yeah. <laughs> so that is how they will get it. Uh, you can also get it. I, I read that it's not unusual for insects to get gooned you know, with plants or with things. So when you can, when you get wound, you could get also viral infection. Um, then you can look at it the other way. You can get it from a human that is infected. Right. And also you can get like very, very tiny crickets that can, uh, it's like carboviruses, but in plants, and they can feed in corn and obtain virus like that. Okay, so if you did a random sampling of insects, any kind, what percentage would be virus infected from the wild, not from your lab? 
I don't know. I can guess, but I don't know. You can guess. It's fine. Ninety-nine percent. Ninety-nine percent. And these would be persistently infected. And they will be persistently infected. Yeah. Uh, what's the biomass of insects compared to prokaryotes in the ocean? Do we have any sense? Mm, I can check for tomorrow. Big. <laughs> tomorrow. <laughs> I'd be curious because that's an interesting number. Yeah, it's an you know, interesting in number. He puts these these interesting. You should do the same for your. I wait. I will calculate that. <laughs> so tell us about. So the main the defense of uh, insects for vir against virus infection is RNA interference. Yes. Is that correct? Can you tell us how that works? So, the first thing to know is like. For a long, long, long time, people really believed that virus, uh, that insects didn't have any antiviral response, okay. and that the innate immunity of insects was mainly directed to bacteria and fungi. So you have the toll pathway, the IMD pathway, and Shackstad pathway, and that perhaps these pathways somehow they will collaborate to eliminate the virus. Then when RNAi was discovered in C. elegans, and it was shown that in plant and C. elegans, one of the main roles of RNA is to be antiviral, that's open, you know, the opportunity to check into insects. And then we discovered that there is a whole new branch of innate immunity in insects that is the RNAi response. So RNAi is this uh, ensemble of pathways dominated by small RNA. So inside the RNAi, you have the Psi RNA pathways, the micro RNA pathway, the Pi RNA pathway for P interacting RNAs. So the main antiviral is the siRNA pathway. So how that works, as soon as you can detect inside the cell double strand RNA, and viruses are very good at doing that, so all RNA viruses will produce it at, as intermediate of replication. Double strand RNA virus is part of the genome, and DNA viruses will do it as conversion transcripts. So as soon as you can detect inside the cell this double strand RNA, it's like a danger signal, it's an alarm. And then you have Dicer, that is a ribonuclease, that come and chop it and produce this so famous 21 siRNAs that change biology. <laughs> so these siRNAs will get loaded into a complex that will scan the cell, the cytoplasm, until it finds something that is 100% complementary. And as soon as it finds it, it will cut it. So okay. normally what will be complementary is the viral genome. So you will hinder replication. All right, so the, the effect of the siRNA is to direct cleavage of the viral genome. It's not the siRNA that is cleaving, it's AGO2. So yeah, yeah, in this complex, the nucleus, there right. is a protein called AGO2 that is the, the heart, right. okay, the core, and it will load and it will cleave. Now you said something before, when the double-stranded RNA is produced, it's detected. Yes. Now what, what is detecting it? it is the, the uh, Dicer detecting it, or is it something Dicer else? Dicer have double strand RNA binding domains. It's a very, it's very good at finding mm. double strand RNA and binding domains. And this is in domain. the cytoplasm all the time. Is the the cytoplasmic localization of the RNAi machinery is quite obscure and very variable depending on the papers you read. So <laughs> they tend to be in the cytoplasm, not very clear where. Yeah. Sometimes they will be in the nuclear, you know. It's, there is no a clear understanding right. of subcellular okay. some localization. Some viruses will make it in the cytoplasm, others in the nucleus, yeah. right? So it's got to be in both places. Normally, it's, it's like accepted, no? That RNAi is, the antiviral response is happening in the cytoplasm. Okay. By the way, I, in reading some of your papers, there are these really n interesting names for genes in Drosophila, and one of them I came across is loquacious. Yes. So, <laughs> what is loquacious? So loquacious <laughs> is, is a factor. So when dice are cut, yes, yeah. it, in order to go and load the RNAi complex, where they go to is, it needs help. And help will be coming for R2D2, R2D2. Exactly. <laughs> and we also have C3PO. C3PO. But okay, <laughs> it great. will come in for R2D2 <laughs> and loquacious. Okay, this is great. What <laughs> other names should we know about? In, on RNAi? Uh, that are funny. Oh, you have tango, you have armadillo, you know. Tango and armadillo, yeah. this is great. And then there's hedgehog, right? That's, yes, that's the old, they that's are the very old. nice names Sonic in Drosophila. Hedgehog. If you find a gene in Drosophila and the function, you are allowed to name it. This is probably why you work on Drosophila, because <laughs> the names are so interesting. Okay, so let's say an insect gets in, so it ingests some virus and it goes to the gut, right? 
insects have a gut tract mm -hmm. and uh, it infects some cells and those cells uh, mount this antiviral response. response. Mm -hmm. um, does that spread elsewhere in the animal to protect it? Yeah, so that is very interesting. The, the exact mechanism, we don't know, but we know that the immune signal that we also don't know what it is, but let's assume that because it's an RNA-based immune system, the immune signal could be a molecule of RNA, could be an RMP, uh, okay? So if you infect, and let's say that you originate an infection in the gut, and then you check for the presence of um, the immune signal in the brain before the virus will get there, right, right. you will find the immune signal there. What do you mean by immune signal? You mean like? This thing that moves, <laughs> and we don't know. So how we read it, we re the readout is silencing, okay? Yeah. So you can get silencing. It's a complicated experiment. It's okay, we, so, we can take it. Okay, so let's do that. You get a virus that has a GFP, okay? Okay. So you have a green virus, and you infect a green drosophila. So a drosophila that express GFP all Everywhere. over, okay? okay? So then this virus will be mainly in the gut, yeah? So day by day, you separate the head from the thorax. You kill your flies and separate the head of the thorax. And then you test for the expression of GFP, the endogenous GFP, in the head. And you see that in absence of the virus on the head, you have silencing of GFP okay. in the head. Okay. And that is because when the virus will replicate, the virus part of the genome now is GFP. So it will do in double strand RNA that will be producing siRNAs, and something is traveling and no, silencing okay. endogenous so GFP. So one possibility is that the, the siRNAs are traveling It could right? be a possibility, but in plants, for example, it, normally it's, it's not the siRNA doing the job. So in Drosophila, what it has been shown is that cells cannot internalize siRNAs. They can deal with long double strand RNA. That has been shown for quite a lot of insects. It has in, also been shown in shrimp. And in plants, you have different kind of movements. You have a short distance movement and a long distance movement because there you can go for the phloem and the silema, you know? And you have a siRNA moving, but also long double strand RNA moving. Okay, so let me see if I have this. In insects, you don't think that the siRNAs are moving distances, it's something else. But if what's, what is silencing is a specific sequence. Yeah, but the right? RNAi is ubiquitous. Every cell will have the RNAi machinery. So if you get double strand RNA into a cell, the cell will chop this double strand RNA and then you will be ready. You will be, you know, it's like you will be immunizing surrounding cells that were never infected. So the, the assumption is that the double-stranded RNA is spreading. Yes, or RNPs. Or RNPs. So they, they would have to get out of cells? Somehow, or communicate in between cells. Perhaps they can use junctions to communicate in between cells. And then they have to get into another cell. Because yes. that specific antiviral sequence has to somehow go to the brain to silence GFP, right? Yeah, it's actually the GFP sequence of the virus that will silence GFP. Right. Because RNAi only work is totally got sequence it, specific. It, right. And so that's a, a big question right now, figuring out how this spreads, right? Yeah, so that is one thing that we have been working for years, trying to nail down the spread, to understand what is moving and how it's moving. And just to be clear for the listeners, this is in contrast to endogenous small RNAs that are made to regulate genes, right? Yes, so then you have the endo-SI RNAs, endo right. yeah, that they will regulate genes. Then you have the microRNA pathway that will mainly do inhibition of translation, right. and it will work in development and pattern and mm -hmm. organ development. And then you have the pyRNA pathway that is specific for the germline, and it will control very, very strictly transposons. So you right. don't have transposons jumping in your germline. And all of these are operative in insects. Is that correct? Uh, all of these pathways are functional in insects. They also work in C. elegans. The, so then the siRNA pathway right. is still highly discussed 
as an antiviral in mammals. There were some nice publications for the lab of Olivier Bonnet and Shao Wei Ding in the beginning of the year, yep. where they described that siRNA in mammals will be antiviral in stem cells, right. where you don't have any kind of immunity yes, developed. Right, right. But it's still subject to intense uh, controversy. controversy. Yes, yes. <laughs> that's, a good, that's a good word. I was going to actually ask you, what side of the controversy do you fall on? It's a very difficult question because when I start my postdoc, yeah. that was just, it was even before Dicer was cloned, it was just when RNAi appeared. So I spent the first two years of my postdoc trying to show that RNAi was antiviral in mammals. Mm -hmm. So I was at Raoul <laughs> lab and I was getting polio and every virus that was going there and I was infecting mouse of every age and dissolving entire mouse and trying to sequence. But even deep sequencing didn't exist at this point. So after two years, I was very much convinced that RNAi was not antiviral in mammals. But I always got this idea that it was perhaps the only way to protect an embryo because mm -hmm. nothing mm -hmm. will protect the embryo. And we know that there is a lot of viruses that will go through the placenta. So if the infection is too bad, you, the embryo will die, but then perhaps there is a way for an embryo to right. get protected. Okay. So we tried to work with stem cells at this point, but I think we were ahead of technology, <laughs> so we couldn't show it. Okay, let's go back to insects now. You just described this wonderful RNA-based defense, right? And if, if I'm understanding it, the virus should be finished. But you're telling us that they persistently infect, so what's going on? That is the obsessive. We're very obsessive. That's what we you're have obsessed obsessive about. behavior. So we always say <laughs> RNA is, is, is so efficient, you know? It's like a hammer, breaking and breaking. So how it's possible that the virus will just grow so much and be so happy inside the insect? If you have a hammer, you will not be very happy. So that really gets us obsessed, and we start looking at what was going on and what were the roots for viral persistence. In order to do that, we move back to cells to make it easy and we establish persistent cell lines that you can also do in Drosophila. You can get naive cells with no viruses at all, and then if you just incubate at low MOI and wait enough, you will have cells that are persistently infected. And these cells behave totally as naive cells when you look at proliferation or differentiation or cell death. It's, persistent is not a result of something like that. But the only thing we found was that the viral titer was lower, like two logs lower, during persistent infection than during acute infection, but still a lot, like 10 to the 6, 10 to the 7 during persistent infection. And if you will get the, the supernatant for your persistent infection and put it in naive cells, you will do acute infection. So it was nothing to do with the virus being weak or... So there was something in the cell controlling that. Something in the cell that was not the RNAi machinery or because Dicer was working fine, AGO2 was working fine, so uh, something was controlling. If you knock those out, what happens to the virus infection? I if you, yes, if you knock cute. down RNAi, the virus replicate like crazy so and your cells will die. There, but you need something else in addition. It's something else, it's okay. something more because in persistent cells, RNAi is working perfectly but the cells are still infected, so there is something else. So at this point, we were kind of against the wall, you know, and we started finding all these papers of people talking that RNA viruses that are non-retroviral could persist in cells under a DNA form. So it, it seems that in the 70s, it was a big Russian school proposing that. Yeah. A lot of Russian people were studying that, like at the end of the 60s or in the 70s. Yeah. And then there are much more recent papers describing that. But nobody really believed these people. And so we say, you know, why not to test? We can also check if we have DNA. And to tell the truth, you know, because that is a nice story that you say in a presentation, but we also got like a lot of RT-PCRs where the control, and we were sure how we were working, was positive. You know, the negative RT has a band. And we knew that 
we were working fine. That is when you really need to trust yourself and your postdoc, you know? <laughs> but, and we did it, and over and over and over, and we will have this one. And then we were doing a lot of deep sequencing to look at the siRNAs, and even though, it's, you know, deep sequencing is not quantitative when you look at the siRNAs, but when you do a lot, you get the eye for that. And we can always identify siRNAs in the persistent cells that didn't appear during acute infection. So then we say, okay, let's check if we have DNA. And there we go, and we have DNA of every virus that we have a persistent cell line for. So this DNA is not the full length, it's a rearrangement, it's always shorter pieces of the virus. And then we say... This is integrated or, f or free in the... It's, we don't know exactly if it's integrated, it's mainly episomal. But I think there is a possibility that one in thousand perhaps will integrate. Okay. That is what happened with VLPs, at least. So then we just check what happened if we don't have DNA. Perhaps there is a, a, a relationship between persistent and the DNA form of an RNA virus. So we use ACT to inhibit reverse transcriptases because our viruses, the tiny RNA viruses, they didn't have any RT. So the RT need to come from the cell. So we check, our cells were full of RT activity. These are Drosophila cells, Drosophila right? cells, yes. And you can check, there is no difference if you get naive cells, persistent cell, acute infected cells. There is a highly a transcription for transposons, you know? So we use ACT and we could inhibit DNA, okay? So now we check what happened when DNA was not there anymore and the cell switch for persistent to acute. So if you don't have DNA, you cannot establish a persistent infection. And the same would happen in flies. So now we did it in vivo, our flies also have a DNA form, and then if we do this long experiment where we feed daily our flies with ACT, you know, and then we challenge with the virus, only the flies where there is no DNA will die. So we have a selective way of eliminating the infected insect, what is super cool. But still, it's telling you that the DNA is important for persistence, but it's not telling you what is the link, because we start talking yeah. about RNAi. Yeah. So then we found that all our pieces of DNA, viral DNA, were in the, in the genome of Drosophila, they were with LTR retrotransposons, okay? So we have these hybrid molecules, transposon virus. And then we found that this <coughs> transposon was getting transcribed, highly transcribed, was producing double strand RNA, and double strand RNA, as I told you, as soon as it's detected, is cleaving a side RNAs. So we were having much more abundant and much more different siRNAs than during an acute infection. So if now you have more siRNAs and more abundant, your antiviral response will be enhanced and you will control better viral titer. So will not, you will not clear the infection. It's too, it's too much cost, I guess, to clear an infection. You will just control enough to be alive and happy. So these uh, retrotransposons have been in the genome for Ever. a long time, yes. probably before other viruses evolved to challenge the insects. So the insect uh, immune system evolved with them and, and uses them to help, yes. right? So in Drosophila, there is highly transposition in somatic cells. That yeah, is described. Yeah. Somatic cells, transposons do a lot of things and sometimes with good impact over the, yep. the health of the genome. So there is a lot of genome plasticity. So I guess one question would be, what about other insects? Is, do they use reverse transcriptase to enhance their immunity? So we know that the system is conserving mosquito. Yep. So we have DNA in mosquitoes infected with dengue or chikungunya, so in the real vector. Yeah. And we know that with ACT, we can inhibit this DNA and that now the mosquito that is infected will die, what is a very nice observation. So I guess, you know, people should go to the lab and take their favorite insect and start doing PCRs <laughs> instead of RT-PCRs. <laughs> 
And I guess we will find much more DNA that we expect. Yeah. And you, as you know, in mammals, there yeah. is a lot of DNA from RNA viruses. I was just going to ask you that. So that was just discovered in the last five years when yes. genomes were being sequenced. There's even real virus DNA in the genome, of all things. <laughs> Influenza, Bornavirus, yes. right? So do you think these are remnants of this? I think defense? they are remnants. There is a very interesting example with the Bornas, yeah. the, the M protein. Some, in some occasions, the M protein, the open reading frame is almost complete, or sometimes yeah, it's yeah. even complete, and there are production of M protein. And in the paper, they, they discuss that the, bo the bovines that, are in, uh, that has expression of the M protein will not get infected. So there is some mm -hmm. kind of passive immunization going on. So um, these are germline copies of these RNA viruses. So they could protect germ cells, as you suggested earlier, for RNAi in mammals, right? It will work only if the DNA form of your virus is getting integrated in germline. Otherwise, that is somatic and is happening only in one organism is not being inherited. No, but if your germ cell is infected with a Borna virus, yes. the DNA is already there and could exactly. contribute Exactly, yeah, perhaps it defense, could protect. Right? It could amplify if siRNA is, in fact, antiviral yes. in those cells. This could enhance it. This could enhance the response, yeah. yeah. I think that's amazing. W one thing that is kind of, because people always ask, so if you get, when you look at the Drosophila genome, do you find a lot of viruses? But the thing is, when the genomes started to be sequenced, they were curated, and everything that was bacterial, virus, yeah, or yeah. weird, it was eliminated. So you have a genome where all these sequences that perhaps were viral are absent. Okay. But I, I guess, no, my, my dream is like actually we have in our genome the story of all the infections we have encountered as a population. Well, of course, in bacteria, that is somewhat the case. The CRISPRs are somewhat yes. of a record of all the insults, not just viral, but plasmid as well, right? Yeah. You have a little piece of each. It has a lot of resemblance to the CRISPR, the CRISPR system. system. Yeah. yeah. So in our genome, you think just by looking at the sequence, you'll be able to see all the insults that we've had. I think we can, yeah, we can I mean, that we have the, re the reconstitute the, the infectious story of a population, yeah. Mm -hmm. By the way, there is a mic here. If any of you have questions, you're welcome to become um, immortalized forever. <laughs> Integrated into the TWIVOM. Yeah, it's pretty good. I'm not even Alan Dove. How about that? <laughs> so what, what are you doing now with this? Is this the end of the story or is there more? No, so there is more because we want to check if this DNA is going to Shermline, if we can transmit protection to the next generation. We want to understand what is the exact mechanism by which the RT is working. We mm -hmm. want to understand why it's episomal and when is it integrated. And perhaps can we just produce some kind of you know, a specific insecticide. Like, you will not go and spray the world with ACT because I don't think that will be <laughs> possible. But perhaps there are ways, because now if you will do transgenic animals that express this episome, yeah. yeah? So then they will be resistant to an infection. So you have different options, like to selectively, you don't want to eliminate insects for everything we were work talking. Mm -hmm. You only want to eliminate the insects that are infected and that will transmit that. So then there are two ways, or you make them clear the infection, or you kill them. But in your case, <laughs> in your case, the, the uh, amplification by RT doesn't eliminate the infection. No, it, just it controls the infection. It controls it. Yeah. So, the question would be, say, in a, in a arbovirus, um, if you reduce the viral burden below a certain point, is that enough to prevent transmission, or do you need to get rid of it entirely? Right. It can be, it, can, it cannot be the only method you can use to yeah, control. Right. It needs to be combined with a lot Something of things. Else, but sure. like I always say, in the absence for years and years of vaccines for arboviruses, you know, like yeah, we don't yeah. have still a solution for dengue or nothing like that. So we need to start thinking at, at the previous step, that is control the vector, but control the vector in a smart way. So um, are, these, are the DNA sequences only found 
uh, after infection, or they, are they there already? So, for example, Drosophila, you infect with flockhouse virus. Yes. I guess it's not a natural virus that's no. infecting that. So there wouldn't. Are there? You said Drosophila C, for example. Are there sequences in the genome of Drosophila? So yeah, if you get flies that are persistently infected, and you go and look for the IV, you will see DNA from the IV. But um, if they're not infected, you don't find this DNA. The ones that are totally clean. We don't find, but then again, we should do genomic deep yeah, sequencing yeah. and look carefully. I am just sure. answering for PCR because results. Because you would think that it would get into the germline and be passed on generationally, mm -hmm. and for that you might need to look out in yeah, the wild. Yeah, but then you need to find really a way to get into the germline. Sure. And this is also has relevance for what's happening in the oceans, because if there are persistent infections, so you don't want to wipe out certain populations, right, it could be controlled by especially in eukaryotic organisms. It could be controlled by yes. a similar system, right? Yeah, no, I think it's really interesting. I'm, I'm also, another area that's incredibly interesting that's relevant is, is the crustacean zooplankton, right? Because, yes. and so I, afterwards I want to talk to you about insect viruses <laughs> and crustacean zooplankton viruses, so. Anything else we should know before we leave? Just believe in insects. <laughs> no, you know, what, you know what I think what you said is really good. You have, at some point you have to trust yourself and your postdoc. Because you, we've all encountered this, you, don't, you can't make sense of this result, right? Yeah. And sometimes we throw it away, and sometimes we do other things. But it was a very hard because it was just when I was starting my tenure track. So yeah. people will advise me and say, stop doing that. You will kill your <laughs> career. You cannot do that. But I believe in what we were doing, yeah, and I think really that important. is important. You know, what you said earlier is very interesting. When I was a graduate student, these papers were published saying that there are DNA copies of RNA viruses in cells. And you're right, nobody believed, believed them. them. Yeah. Because we didn't understand the extent of endogenous sequences, retroviral sequences that there were RTs. This is probably even before RT yes. was discovered. Yeah, perhaps, 70s. And right. a lot of these individuals their careers went nowhere, but they were right. They were <laughs> because right. Because now we know yes. that cells have reverse transcriptase in them. But unfortunately, they've left the field a long time ago. It's really too bad. And there's something to be learned there. But it's way beyond me, so I won't try. Anyway, um, thank you both for doing this. I want to wrap up this episode of TWIV. This one will be released in the next few months. Um, you can find TWIV at twiv.tv. You can find it at iTunes. And uh, if you like what we do and you want to help us, go to iTunes and rate the show or give it some stars. That really helps us a lot. And we love getting your questions and comments. We answer them usually on our episodes. You can send them to twiv at twiv.tv. I want to thank my two guests uh, for joining me today. Curtis Suttle from the University of British Columbia. Thank you. Thank you so much. I've been wanting to have you on TWIV since I heard you in Tegrancy, so this was a great opportunity. <laughs> I appreciate it. By the way, do you get seasick? Mm, only if it's really rough. Rough? Okay. <laughs> then you just have to throw up between experiments and you come back. <laughs> <laughs> and Carla Sally from the Inst Institut Pasteur, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Two great stories here. and. Uh, it's the things we don't normally talk about. So I really welcome the opportunity to do this. I want to thank Terry Dermody, who is still here. He hasn't <laughs> left. He's sitting in the audience. Thank you for inviting me to do this. I appreciate it, because it's always nice to tap into uh, new investigators for this show. I want to thank the International Congress of Virology, the organizers, for letting me do this, and also uh, for the audience for staying here until the very end. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. Thanks, guys. Thank you. That was great. Oh, thank you very much.